Hello and welcome to Ukraine This Week with me, Don Arleth. It's your one-stop shop to take stock of all the progress on the political and literal battlefields. Let's go ahead and get started. We start off with Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv. Russian forces have been attacking the city on a daily basis and this week successfully destroyed its TV tower. The structure, which managed to survive more than two years of Russian attacks, collapsed on Monday. A Russian missile struck the Kharkiv TV tower directly, causing it to break in half. The attack is part of a renewed wave of missile strikes directed at the city. Just this week, assaults caused at least six serious injuries and damaged dozens of cars and apartments. The situation in the city is further complicated by a lack of stable power supply caused by the destruction of electrical substations in recent weeks. Another city where civilians are being affected by Russian strikes is Konstantinivka. The Russian advance on nearby Chasivyar is bringing the front line ever closer to the city and with it increased bombardment by the Russian Air Force. Another village in the Donetsk region has reportedly been taken over by Russian forces, though Kyiv disputes this claim. Shortages of ammunition have made the defense of Ukrainian troops difficult, to say the least. The village of Novomikhailivka, or rather the ruins that once made it up, is now reportedly in Russian hands. Its capture comes amid similar advances in the neighboring sectors of the front line, achieved by Russian forces in recent months. The capture of Avdiivka back in February has forced Ukrainians to defend areas which were fortified to a much lesser extent. Shortages of ammunition caused by a disruption in U.S. aid have also made the defenders' situation difficult, as new defensive lines are constantly being improved and U.S. aid starts flowing again, further Russian advances should become more costly. While Russia attacks Ukrainian cities and civilian infrastructure, Kyiv's forces are not sitting on their laurels. In a bid to turn the tides on the Russian war machine, an increasingly creative and diverse range of methods is being used to strike deep behind enemy lines. A Russian oil depot near Smolensk was set on fire after being struck by a number of Ukrainian drones. This is just the latest in a long series of Russian oil facilities targeted and set on fire in recent months. Kyiv has been developing attack drones with increasingly longer operating ranges by utilizing small civilian aircraft. These drones can strike targets located over 1,000 kilometers from Ukrainian lines, threatening more and more Russian industrial facilities. This week also saw a major blaze in Omsk, deep in Siberia. This suggests that Ukraine is relying not only on long-range drones, but on old-fashioned sabotage as well. And now let's take a look at the front lines in eastern Ukraine. Of course, moving from the south near the city of Kherson, not much has changed. It isn't until we get to the area of Marinka where you, uh, Russian troops have been advancing in that area. Of course, uh, deadly attacks we've been seeing getting ever closer to the Kostyanitivka, excuse me for that, uh, the city. Gradually, the Russian forces are uh, making progress in that area. Now, moving further up to the north uh, near Avdivka, let's see if we can get that up. Near the city of Avdivka, of course, Russian troops are advancing in several areas here. Of course, down in the southern uh, part here near Umainsky, they are pushing in several directions and Okharetine and Karamik as well. Um, this direction looks like the most threatening, of course, going along this highway. Uh, there are unconfirmed reports that Russian forces continue to advance along that roadway. However, uh, that is yet to be confirmed exactly the extent. We do know that the gray areas, the gray area along the front line has increased um, rather significantly in the last week or so. But now let's move up to Chassis Vyar, which is a very important city uh, in the Donetsk region. Let's see if we can get that map up. Of course, this is the city adjacent to Bakhmut. 
Last year, Bakhmut was taken by Russian forces, and Chassi Vyar has been a fortress, if you will, for Ukrainian forces um, in that area. Chassi Vyar also being a strategically important city in that it is the key way. It is the it is, uh, opens the door to the strategically important cities of Constant, uh, excuse me, of Konstantinivka to the, to the south, uh, as well as Krematorsk and Slovyansk. Um, now, if we look at Chasivya Ivanivsky, it, there are con unconfirmed reports that uh, the area has been taken over by Russian forces, but we've also heard that the Ukrainians have regained control of the road going from the canal all the way up to Ivanivsky. However, the Russians are on the north side of the road. If we look at Bodanivka, uh, it seems that that village has been overrun by Russian troops and Ukrainians have had to make a strategic withdrawal a little bit further west of that city. However, we have also heard from a few different sources this week that the Ukrainians are on the attack and they are pushing Russian forces back in several parts of the city and therefore uh, we will talk about that in just a moment. Well that is the uh, front lines in at a glimpse of course we are waiting for uh, this desperately needed military assistance from the United States from the United Kingdom uh, as well as those badly needed artillery shells from that Czech led ammunition coalition to make their way to the front lines uh, but we're not expecting overnight relief. We do know that attackums uh, have now been unleashed on long-range targets for Ukrainian forces. Hopefully that will provide a little bit of relief until these heavy military equipment and ammunition makes its way to the front lines. Well, now I'm going to leave you with some images from the front lines, and we'll be right back. And now it's time to look at the war in Ukraine through a journalist lens. Joining me now is longtime journalist who is now in the armed forces of Ukraine, Sergeant Sarah Ashton Cirillo. Hi, Don. How are you doing? Uh, as you were just discussing today, it is a very active eastern front here in the Donbass. However, the morale of the armed forces of Ukraine, as well as some successes of the armed forces of Ukraine, are becoming more known every day. Right. Obviously, uh, I try and show what I can along the front lines, talking to people, especially like you've been reporting for us this week, giving us updates from Chassis VR. Thank you very much for that, first of all. Um, but, you know, regarding the city there, we've because we've heard, you know, the, the Russian advances, we've also heard about the pushbacks, that the Ukrainians are pushing uh, uh, Russians back, and, and that is 
indeed significant because Chassis Vyar is a, is a very important city. Um, so since you've been down there in Chassis Vyar, I mean, what are your overall impressions that you can share with us? Absolutely. It's been a pleasure bringing information to the viewers of TVP World on your show, Don. And today we have a much clearer view for the audience as to what's taking place. So due to the fact that uh, ever since the USA package was signed by President Biden, we yep. witnessed today the intensified attacks by the Russian enemy, which has uh, been said by these recon uh, guys to have increased in the days following the uh, Ukraine supplemental aid bill coming into effect. However, what this has also allowed is an increased pushback by my colleagues in the armed forces of Ukraine and Ukrainian defense forces under the leadership of President Zelensky, under the leadership of Colonel General Sierski, our commander in chief. We are not giving up any ground in any sort of manner that would allow the Russians to think that they will take any of the key cities in the Donbass, uh, let alone Shazavyar. Right now, um, talking about this, uh, this you know, military support package passed finally out of the U.S. Congress. Tell me, how is that affecting the mindset, the morale of soldiers there on the front lines? I can imagine just a week ago, it was probably a little bit different than it is right now. I've asked every single soldier that I've interacted with, every single officer I've interacted with since being here in the Shah Zaviar area, including being in Shah Zaviar today, and all of them have stated that it has had a tremendous impact. The United States, the American people standing with the Ukrainian Defense Forces and the people of Ukraine has made a tremendous difference. It's this infusion of energy, Don, that the people of Poland recognize, the people of the Baltics, and the people of Ukraine who have known for more than 10 years now fighting against the Russian enemies. This sort of infusion of energy is going to be a punch in the face of, of the Kremlin because it's going to be followed up by long-range attack guns. It's going to be followed up this summer by F-16s. It's going to be followed up by the destruction of the Kerch Bridge, the retaking of areas in Donetsk Oblast, Luhansk Oblast, and and down in the south in Zaporizhia and Kherson Oblast. So ultimately, this is just the first sign that uh, the Russian invasion is crumbling and the American people realized it and that's why the House of Representatives stood strong along with the Senate and President Biden in making certain we have the equipment we need to make certain that Ukraine is victorious against the Kremlin. Certainly. Now, um, concerning the activity around the front lines, I, I know you can tell me a little. You can't tell me everything, but um, you know, generally, do you are you hearing a lot of artillery? Are you witnessing? Are you seeing a lot of Russian drones? You know, what is the what is the situation on the battlefield look like? Today, when we were in the city with the 41st Brigade's Recon Division, which are some of the most professional soldiers in the world, not even within the Ukrainian Defense Forces. What we noticed, there were FPV drones overhead. There was a tremendous amount of aviation activity, including on the Ukrainian Defense Force aside from the Air Force of the Armed Forces of Ukraine and the Russians. FPVs are everywhere. You can't go into the city with having, without having personal electronic warfare defense devices on top of your vehicle. We were running through back alleys. We were running through burnt out buildings. However, in doing so, the Ukrainian defenders were able to take up positions which were precluding Russia from truly making any advances. Yeah, it's got to be a uh, real difficult, especially dodging all those drones. I know it's terrifying. Uh, well, Sir Sergeant Sarah Ashton Cirillo, thank you very much for uh, all that you've given us this week. We appreciate it and stay safe. Thank you to the people of Poland, to TVP World and to everyone who supports Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Arom Slava. And now I'm going to leave you with some images about other Russian attacks on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. Let's have a look.
After months of tense negotiations, U.S. military aid to Ukraine is set to resume in full swing. The delay has caused crucial material shortages, which have set the Ukrainian armed forces on the back foot. On Wednesday, U.S. President Joe Biden signed a bill authorizing approximately $61 billion in military aid to Ukraine. It's a good day for America, it's a good day for Europe, and it's a good day for world peace, for real. The move will increase the transfer of supplies to the embattled nation after months of shortages. Over the past six months, Ukraine has had to ration ammunition, and that has resulted in the loss of some territory in the east, including the city of Avdivka. And while today's announcement is very good news for Ukraine, they are still under severe pressure on the battlefield. Kyiv is especially reliant on the U.S. when it comes to ammunition for its tube artillery, as well as the HIMARS missiles. The White House has also confirmed that a significant number of long-range attack AMS missiles will be provided. The small number supplied previously has proven highly effective. These can be used to strike deeper behind Russian lines, complicating logistics and making Ukraine's shortages less severe in comparison. Ukraine is reliant on Western countries not only for ammunition, but for funds to run the civilian side of its government as well. The European Union has provided 1.5 billion euros to Kyiv this week alone, after providing 4.5 billion last month. And now here to discuss what this U.S. aid package can and cannot do is Mikhail Alexeev, professor at San Diego State University. Hello and thanks. thank you very much for joining us today on Ukraine This Week. Good to be with you. Indeed. Now, um, looking, uh, while you're in the United States, you got to see all this debate unfold for the last six months, and I'm sure that you were keeping your fingers crossed, along with everybody over here, uh, hoping that this aid package would get passed through. Um, now, it has been passed. We know that long-range attackums were previously sent in some quantities, some mysterious quantities, and then we also know that more have been sent um, now, but we also know that there's a lot of kit that still needs to make it to the front lines. Um, so your impressions of this overall bill, what can this achieve like right now in the short term and in the longer term, in your opinion? Well, this is a, a very significant, positive, um, absolutely vital package of assistance to Ukraine. It has significance, which is uh, military, of course, strategic also in terms of uh, policy and uh, relations overall, it has uh, some big significance uh, as well. Uh, in terms of military assistance, uh, uh, I see that uh, it is helping already uh, plug important holes for Ukraine in terms of um, anti-tank mines, for instance, uh, the uh, Javelin uh, anti-tank weapons, uh, Stingers, uh, and, and of course the longer range uh, TACOMS uh, missiles, the HIMARS missiles, these are all very important uh, components. For example, the latest Russian advances around the place called Ocheretine were in part due to the fact that Ukraine didn't have enough anti-tank mines and the Russians found gaps uh, in that line of defense and were able to make significant territorial gains. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of um, capability that Ukraine will increasingly get and would, would able to hold the lines better and push the Russians back more, uh, also degrade uh, their supply lines and, and their infrastructure, uh, hoping to wear down their forces and perhaps even pave the way for Ukrainians to uh, regain territory later. Uh, the problem is uh, and where um, I would like to see more advances and, and faster advances uh, is with um, aircraft. Uh, ultimately, uh, the, the big, one of the biggest trump cards uh, that Russia has are those glide bombs. And the number of Russian aerial attacks on Ukraine in recent uh, weeks increased. I was monitoring uh, the situation and uh, they were talking about, say, 90 or so aerial uh, bombardments a day. Now we're talking over 100 and 150 bombardments a day. And those are very hard 
weapons for Ukraine to defend against. The glide bombs that are launched from aircraft, once they are launched, uh, they are almost impossible, practically impossible to detect right. uh, and to defend against. And what they do is they destroy Ukraine's defensive positions, which then allow the Russians to push uh, with uh, massive infantry and armor assaults and make those gains. So the, um, uh, the, the more uh, assistance Ukraine gets in longer range anti-aircraft weaponry and in uh, fighter aircraft itself, uh, the, um, then we will talk more about some serious uh, changes uh, and perhaps uh, more serious game changes uh, in the war. Right. Unfortunately, those F-16s also being late. Uh, I remember looking back when we had the uh, counteroffensive, you know, I was waiting on those weapons to accumulate, right, to the, to the point where Ukraine could effectively use them. But it looks like that time also allowed the Russians to really dig in and fortify their lines of defense. And we all know that that counteroffensive didn't go very far, but that's a great point. Uh, see some, some, some aircraft make it to Ukraine as well as more advanced air defense systems uh, probably won't completely solve the, the aerial or the, the, the glide bomb situation but will definitely help. Now a lot of people are speculating and probably, uh, you'd probably be a good person to clarify this or at least express your opinion. A lot of people are talking about these long-range attackums and with Ukraine having the ability to effectively hit anywhere in Crimea uh, well, there are a lot of voices out there saying now could be a good time to really let them rain down on the Kerch Strait Bridge. But my question is now the right time. It was my understanding before that it would be a good uh, it would be a good idea to take out the Kerch Strait Bridge. But once you could kind of pinch off the land bridge, uh, would probably be the best timing. So I, I don't know. Many people have different opinions on this. What is your opinion? Should they hit the Kerch Strait Bridge right now? If they can, well, or or should they well, wait? Well, well, my view on the Kerch Bridge was that Europe should have imposed massive sanctions on Russia and stop it from building it in the first place <laughs> after 2014. <laughs> so that 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 view holds, and and uh, clearly that 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 is a, a, a very uh, important target uh, for Ukraine to hit uh, as well. Russia, of course, now has the land bridge and. Uh, improving supplies there, but that is also where uh, Ukraine is capable of hitting. So the, to answer your question, simply Ukraine needs uh, to block all of those lines of supply because Crimea is uh, a very uh, important staging ground for, uh, for the Russian invasion. Certainly. Um, and also what we've seen come out, some kind of mixed signals from the U.S. administration. Uh, one I think that is deeply upsetting for Ukrainians is uh, criticism against uh, striking targets in Russia with Ukrainian homegrown weaponry, right? We have, we've been seeing aircraft repurposed to become long-range drones and wreaking havoc on Russian oil refineries, which are in turn, and not only, but are used to uh, absolutely fund Russia's war machine. Um, from the U.S. perspective, do you think the administration was, there was a big mistake by the U.S. administration to even, to even mention that? Because for me, it's absurd. I think that these kinds of uh, conversations and, and these kinds of exchanges of views uh, are in the state of flux. Uh, this is something that uh, perhaps uh, there, there was some situation uh, with maybe one of those hits that uh, raised particular concerns and maybe caused some alarm. Uh, there is still, um, and, I, and I think it is an overcautious view uh, in the Biden administration. I think it borders on uh, that, uh, that there is this kind of uh, view that uh, if Russia is hit too hard, it may not want to eventually negotiate. And, and there are still people who kind of keep that negotiations door open. Whereas if you look at the trajectory of the war, if you look at the uh, action response uh, record uh, of the Russian forces to Ukrainian attacks, uh, I would actually think that that, that self-deterrence uh, is not justified. Uh, that um, it's kind of the opposite, that uh, the more 
Ukraine is able to hurt Russian capabilities, uh, the more Russians sort of uh, retreat and, and scale back. They, they, of course, regroup and they keep advancing and they keep uh, pursuing their overall objective of occupying Ukraine. Uh, but these are the kinds of things uh, that ultimately would make the Kremlin think and also ultimately may undermine the cohesion and fighting capacity uh, of the Russian military, as we saw with the Prigozhin rebellion, which was caused by uh, very staunch and, and, and uh, spirited Ukrainian military resistance. Right. Well, it cer certainly has a certain tactical and psychological effect for sure. Um, now, back to this uh, aid package from the coming out of the United States. What are your expectations? Expectations, excuse me. You know, this is a, an election year. We are going to have the presidential election in the United States coming up in November. So um, we probably won't see another aid package until then. Therefore, uh, how effective do you think that this amount of weaponry is going to be for the Ukrainians this year? And um, well, is any, is any end to the war in sight with this package? Well, um, if we put things in perspective, uh, the previous uh, amount of military aid that the United States provided to Ukraine uh, depends on what you exactly count and how you estimate ranged uh, around $40 billion. This package uh, is $60 billion. It includes other types of assistance. Uh, but we're talking about uh, significantly more resources being given to Ukraine within that year compared to the previous two years. Uh, and so the uh, and also uh, with the upcoming aircraft and longer range missiles, uh, there is a possibility uh, for Ukraine uh, to um, change uh, the tide of war in, in major ways. I think also part of the um, situation is you, you're right about the elections and about uncertainty uh, over the future, but I think what this package does, it creates the opportunity for other NATO allies to step up uh, for Europe uh, in partnership with Ukraine as well to beef up military industries. Uh, ultimately, uh, Ukraine will need to produce uh, a lot of uh, its own basic ammunition. Uh, some of these factories or most of these factories probably will have to be located in Europe uh, to provide just elementary bullets and shells for Ukrainian artillery. If Ukraine holds that baseline uh, with uh, conventional ammunition, then the technological superiority uh, that uh, will come uh, in this new aid package with uh, systems like Attackums and HIMARS and, and other systems and Patriots, that then it will begin giving Ukraine more of an edge. Right, right. It'll all come together. Right. And I didn't even mention uh, what's going on here in Europe. And of course, the UK also offering a significant support package. So uh, yes, well, fingers crossed. Um, uh, Mikhail Alexiev, Professor, San Diego State University. Thank you very much for joining me on Ukraine this week. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Ukraine has recently passed a new mobilization law seeking to replace losses sustained during two years of war. In connection with these reforms, Kiev is also trying to bring in draft dodgers who are hiding abroad. Earlier this month, the Ukrainian parliament widened the age range for men covered by the mobilization order. This move is intended to provide relief to the overstretched armed forces. The enemy outnumbers us by seven to ten times. We lack manpower. I ask you, pass this law. We need it badly. We need it very much. We are holding the defenses on the last breath. Kyiv's mobilization efforts have been hampered by widespread draft dodging. Many Ukrainian men have found ways to leave the country or simply decided to not return in order to avoid being drafted. Now Kyiv has announced that military-age men residing abroad will not be able to use consular services or acquire passports. An exception will be made for men seeking to return to Ukraine. 
While most fighting age men are prohibited from leaving Ukraine, estimates suggest over 600,000 have done so anyway since the war began. An attempt to bring them into the mobilization system follows a similar crackdown on fraudulent disability documents being used for draft dodging within Ukraine. And now I'd like to welcome to the program Bartosz Cichotsky, ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, excuse me, former ambassador to Polish ambassador to Ukraine. Thank you for joining me on Ukraine this week. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, it's really interesting what we've seen this week uh, announced by the foreign ministry of Ukraine saying that they were going to suspend consular services for all Ukrainian military aged men, right? So uh, I believe this applies to 20. I've seen different claims, 18 to 60 or 20 to 60. Um, now, I think this is an effort for them to not reissue passports that expire um, because technically these people should be in Ukraine according to the law. Um, so I wanted to get your overall opinion on this and uh, try and find out whether this is going to be an effective means for Ukraine to get its men back to potentially be conscripted. Well, the Ukrainian authorities struggle with uh, lack of human force. Uh, the, the, the troops are not rotating uh, as they should because there is little man to uh, substitute those fighting. <coughs> so I can see the, um, the point, the reason why the government is uh, trying different ways to cover for this uh, problem. Uh, but if, if I was to, to advise the government, I, I would tell them to avoid um, steps that actually uh, make the, this problem visible for the international community. Uh, there were voices um, in different capitals that why we should actually supply, send weapons or, or aid to Ukraine if, if they don't, if they kind of are hes hesitating to fight. And of course, those are little numbers of, uh, of those who um, left Ukraine illegally uh, in violation of, of the martial law uh, or, or otherwise, right. but, uh, but it, it becomes visible and, and this, is, this could be counterproductive. We've seen in 2022nd hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians leaving their jobs, leaving their comfortable um, living in Poland to fight in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, it, if this picture is to be kind of uh, changed, affected by those pictures from Ukrainian consulates uh, in Europe, this would, this, would, this would make a lot of damage to, to Ukraine. I, I believe there are ways to stop uh, conscripts illegally leaving Ukraine. If when they left Ukraine, I would rather advise a sort of campaign, uh, um, the incentives, uh, uh, positive, I would say, um, uh, action to convince them, those who uh, those who fall under the the conscription, uh, to come back and, and fight. Uh, negative, negative steps, um, I'm, I'm not sure they would work. Well, I'm, I'm also wondering to what extent, uh, because we know President Zelensky at the outbreak of the war, I remember when the uh, refugees were flowing across the border into Poland, President Zelensky was pretty upset at that, and actually a lot of people in Ukraine were, I remember going on the other side of the border uh, and hearing many opinions that uh, People were just furious with all the people that left Ukraine. They felt abandoned. Uh, so I wonder if this is a combination or kind of a perfect storm. I also hear that um, U.S. senators who have traveled to Ukraine have also put president, uh, pressure on President Zelensky uh, to force through this uh, mobilization bill and to get more fighters on the front line. Uh, do you think it's a combination of, of all those pressures and knowing that, that Russia has much more manpower than Ukraine does? Definitely there was a, there was a struggle and, and the mobilization law uh, was 
meant to, to, to be helpful for U.S. congressmen to, to move on with, with the aid package. It's done, but we are still far from implementation. The, the, the kind of, it's not processed, mm -hmm. the aid package. So I would be very careful with um, kind of underlying, provoking um, cases um, which are actually uh, exemptions. Mm -hmm. But peop, you know, public opinions work in a peculiar way. And, and this and should not- politicians. <laughs> they should They should not, Th those pictures from the Ukrainian consulates should not become a, a standard. Of course, um, it's hard to judge. If, if the war uh, came to, to Poland or other country, we would also see some people living. Not everyone is born to fight. Mm -hmm. uh, many of those refugees, um, in, uh, Ukrainian refugees in Poland or Germany or in the UK, they are helping a lot with money, with collecting, with, with drones, with, um, you know, uh, sending aid to their families. Uh, business economy is a parallelly important front of this war. They, they need money, they need taxpayers uh, as much as they need fighters. Uh, but um, PR images are important. Some people saying they're more effective uh, doing just that, raising, uh, raising money or, or, or drones for the armed forces uh, while they're over here. Some, some of them, but of course, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, that there's law. If someone left Ukraine illegally or paid a bribe, uh, he, he or she pretends she's unable physically to, to fight, then of course Ukrainian authorities have right to request Poland, Slovakia, other countries to verify if Mr. XYZ is registered there and, and uh, if he crossed the border illegally, then obviously, according to our law, he or she should be sent back. Uh, Ukrainian authorities are saying that there is no mechanism in place for them to be able to force these people to come home, but rather they won't issue new documents and the only way to do that is to go back to Ukraine uh, and, and, and rectify the situation. But I think different European countries are going to deal with this in a different matter. So when people's documents expire, uh, how do you think Poland, for instance, will, will respond to this? Do you think the issuance of so-called gray passports uh, might be in store here in Poland? I, I know that Germany, they're considering of doing... Yeah, I've issue. heard about the, yeah. the statements from Germany. They are, uh, well, surprising to say, to say the least. Whatever we, uh, our authorities would do, they should coordinate with, with the Ukrainian authorities. But anyway, forcing people to fight is is not effective. No. Uh, Ukraine is not Russia. They, they mm -hmm. cannot. Um, we, we see those um, former prisoners, criminals uh, from in Russia forced to fight. This is not, uh, we are democracies. This is, right. It doesn't work uh, like this in, in on our side. But incentives, campaigns, uh, information, education, um, this is uh, maybe, you know, uh, requesting people not necessarily to fight on the front line, but they can be useful, they can be helpful uh, in logistics, in, in, uh, in healthcare, uh, in um, firefighting uh, y units. Th those are, uh, war is a very complicated thing and um, surprising, not well thought decisions may not be best friends in, in this endeavor. Certainly. Um, I, well, another request that the government is making is so f for all of these uh, military age men that are residing abroad, um, the, the authorities are requesting that they register online um, and they give personal details since uh, their, their visa status. Uh, where they live, um, certain personal information, and the authorities in Kyiv say that they're doing this so that they, first of all, are no longer looking for them in Ukraine, that they have nothing to fear, they won't be, again, conscripted and forced to go home. But many people, many Ukrainians are also fear, fearful of doing this because they, well, they fear um, that somehow this information will Th be There would be next step, them. next step. Right, right, so, I mean, is, 
what do you think? Should people be afraid? Should people comply? Because maybe it would help the authorities in, in, in Kyiv stop wasting resources looking for these people and understand that they are abroad and they, are, they don't apply for, for mobilization. I mean, uh, you know, when, when the damage has been done, it's very difficult now to tell people, look, calm down, everything is just to, to check your whereabouts, etc. Now when, when Ukraine suddenly stopped the, the consular services, uh, people are angry and I guess uh, we need, will need some time to explain those things uh, which are perfectly logical and, and uh, clever and uh, based in, in, in a legal framework. Um, uh, but now they are nervous and I, and I guess, uh, and I guess uh, the best way for, for the authorities of Ukraine and, and their uh, partners in the West is to sit together, think of how to, how to do it the right way. Uh, you know, uh, Poland is is part of Schengen area. If if we will start, I cannot imagine kind of hunting for Ukrainian conscripts. In right. it, this would be useless. They right. would move to other countries. Our economy needs them. If, uh, our economy, uh, if if they are useful for our economy, Poland as a country can help more. I mean, to to put to make long story short, uh, to to be more helpful to Ukraine. So you know, carefully, uh, I would say, right. with uh, all those sort of a Sort of a, maybe not a PR success, I guess we can sum that up. Yeah. Um, I, just before we go, I wanted to ask you about this, uh, the Minister of Agriculture in Ukraine who's just been arrested on a $7 million illegal land transfer, according to the accusations, uh, Mykola Solsky. Uh, what do you know about this case, and is it politically motivated, in your opinion? I'm sorry to hear it. Um, we are friends with Mikola Solsky. We went through difficult times uh, during those um, protests on, on the Polish-Ukrainian borders, farmers' protests, uh, the, those embargoes, etc. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, of course, uh, the prosecutor's court should, you know, uh, rule the, in this story. Uh, everything should be clarified. From what I understand, this is those accusations. They they concern time long time before Mikola became minister. Um, we, we hear too many times uh, media tell us about corruption claims and then people, senior officials in Ukraine are dismissed, but nothing happens actually. Nobody, nobody was taken to court. This is the first case when there is uh, anti-corruption agency kind of submitted uh, the case and let's see, uh, let's see where the investigation goes. let's see yeah. but if uh, again there I talk to people and they have a feeling that there is some sort of a selective justice that that people everyone is doing same things but then somebody decides for political reasons that that the law know, applies to, to mr. X or Mr. Y. This would be this would be bad, but let let the justice do their work. Okay, Ambassador Bartosz Chichotsky, thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate it. And that concludes this edition of Ukraine This Week. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week. Goodbye.